glad to have Lou Brady with us this evening. Uh, for those that are tuning in watching us, he's a uh, grandson of uh, a preacher, and his dad's a preacher, so uh, we're tickled to death that uh, that lineage is carried on and hopefully one of these days uh, down the road that uh, if he ever has any children there, his young son there, that, that can, will continue. So, uh, Pleased to introduce Luke Brady. Dave came up to me Wednesday night and said, uh, so are you going to preach for us sometime here soon? I said, yeah, let's go. He said, why ain't going to be here Sunday? He said, you got anything ready? I said, yeah. So here I am, it's Sunday. This is a sermon that I actually wrote uh, a while back. I uh, got the idea of being mom and dad and Says we're going down the road after service one day. I uh, really don't remember what started the conversation, but as conversation goes, we went from one thing to another to another, and somehow we got to talking about the acts of worship. So it dawned on me the more I thought about that that I've kind of been slipping up personally in the acts of worship and how I looked at things. I started to see the services having some important parts and some parts that were less important, things that were to be more attentive to and things that were okay to kind of slack off with regards to. If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John. The main text for this lesson will be in the book of John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Starting with verse 23. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. For God is the Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's something that we hear quite often is worship in spirit and in truth. That's really the main basis of my lesson this evening is how we can look at the acts of worship to understand better how we can worship in spirit and in truth. So growing up, I was accustomed to the way that we had the service here, which is not the same as it used to be. We've made some changes. And as the years have gone by, we've, made, we've had things run a little differently. But the way the service went that I always was accustomed to was we would pray, we would sing a song, we would pray again, we would have the Lord's Supper, and we would pray within the Lord's Supper. We would have the collection, we would have more songs, the sermon, and the invitation song, and a closing prayer. And you're, you know, something along those lines. But, you know, I got used to that, and I really found myself getting into a rut spiritually when I was looking at the significance of each of the separate parts of the worship service. So even if it doesn't necessarily pertain to you, if you're not struggling with seeing one thing as more important than the other, it's still good to go, what you can say is back to basics. And you can strengthen your faith and increase your knowledge about the acts of worship as we go through this lesson. So the acts of worship that I've spoken of so far, we're commanded to pray, we're commanded to sing hymns, we're commanded to study, to partake of the Lord's Supper, and to give back to the Lord. So after the conversation that I had with my family, I started studying each of these separately. And I got the idea that I would turn it into a lesson if I ever got the chance to preach it. So... When I started looking into things, I understand now that true worship requires that we give the same amount of effort to each of the five acts of worship that I've mentioned that we give to any of the others. So that is to say that we give the same effort to praying and being attentive to a prayer that we're being led in as we do to the singing, or as we do to being attentive to the lesson. So it's human nature to try to rank things. Everything that we do in our lives rank. Everything is in a in an order. So it's easy for you to say, oh, okay, the prayer is important because we're speaking to God, but I've really got to focus on the Lord's Supper because that's, that's more important. Or say something along the lines of, I've heard this sermon before, basically this is really similar to something else I've heard. I can kind of check out here. Or I have a terrible voice. I'm, I'm not a very good singer. I just won't sing. But if they're all of equal importance, why do we not put forth the same effort into each thing that we put into all the others? Right. So the goal of this lesson, as I said, is to look at a true worship service according to this passage, of worshiping in spirit and in truth, and evaluate if the way that we personally serve God 
in service, in the service, is according to God's will and according to what's in the, in the Bible. So we'll start with prayer, which is often how we begin a worship service, with an opening prayer. So if you look at prayer, we can determine that prayer is an action that's to be performed in every worship service if you look into God's Word. That's really where you should find the basis for anything that's done, especially in a worship service. So if you look at the early church, and they're meeting in 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, if you want to go ahead and turn over there, we see that there was publicly led prayer in the worship service that they were attending. Now, this is a church that was closely removed from Christ being on the earth with them, so I see that it's a strong model for how we should, uh, how we should worship today as well. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, says, What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. So, prayer as an act of worship is defined as an address to God with a capital G, or a God with a lowercase g, in word or in thought. But to us as Christians, it's more than that. So, we understand that the Lord hears and answers our prayers. He may not always answer with yes or no. He may answer with not at this time. But God does not ever leave a prayer unanswered. So, we understand that this is an address to God. And it's more than simply an address. We are speaking to the supreme being of all the universe. So, when we're in a worship service and a man is leading us in prayer, remember that. Remember that this is the creator of everything that is, was, and will ever be. And all he had to do was speak it into existence. And he's asked that we pray to him. So, when we're being led in prayer, there are a few ways that we can go about it. When you're being led in prayer, it's not just the one man who's leading the prayer that's standing alone and speaking to God. He's speaking to God on your behalf, on our behalf, as Christians in the assembly at that time. Right. So it's the same as if you were in private praying to the Lord for yourself. You address it the same way. If we look at it as one man praying, like I said, I had a problem with checking out. It's not something that we can just check out. We have to look at it as an address to God on behalf of each and every one of us. So, moving on from prayer, talk about the scene. As a song leader personally, and as any other song leader can attest, I'm sure it's frustrating sometimes to start a song and then not have very many people that are very enthusiastic about the singing. And it's not an attempt to call anyone out for anything personally. I've been, an, I've been bad for this myself. It's a song I don't know or a song I may not particularly like the way that it's written or worded or something like that. But when we go into the singing, it's a commandment from the Lord that we have to sing. So we know that it's to be done in the service because, once again, if you go back to the early church and look at the early church's example, Look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Ephesians 5 and 19 says, Speak with yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. See so here? Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is, this is in a worship service at this time. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, back to chapter Back to 1 Corinthians. It says, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Everything that's been done so far with the prayer and with the singing, both of them have been doing it with the Spirit as well as with the mind. And this really goes back to the original text saying, we worship God in spirit and in truth. The worship is not to simply be physical. It is to be a spiritual, emotional connection to the Lord. This is how we fulfill the commandments of the Lord directly in worship service. So when we sing, it is to be done to the glory of God, and it doesn't matter if you have an amazing voice. Thank God that it doesn't, because if it was only the people that had a great voice who were fulfilling God's will, how many of us would be left out? We wouldn't be serving the Lord the right way. And that's really the error in saying, you know, I don't have a great voice, I'm not going to sing. The problem there is, if you don't have a great voice and you don't sing, it comes in that 
the Lord has commanded everyone to sing. He didn't command everyone to sing well. There's, there's, the, there's the connection there. We shouldn't just be mumbling through things just to get through it. We should be happy to be able to serve the Lord this way. This is something that we've been commanded to do. And it should be amazing that we can serve the Lord who has given us everything, given us our salvation. He sent His Son to die the most painful death on the cross for us. And this is a small thing that we can do to give back to Him and to worship Him. So, this is an active service. This is We are following along with the song. We're singing along. We are paying close attention to the words. The words of these songs have been written by people through the years, and they have great meaning. If you look at some of these songs, I know we've had some men stand up here and do entire sermons on a single song or a couple songs. It's amazing that we can have these. They can strengthen your faith. They can set your mind to the right place if you sing before the Lord's Supper or before a sermon to set your mind on the task at hand. So, while I'm talking about singing, there is something that has to be brought up. Uh, singing and worship is commanded to be done in one way. If you look at all the examples in the Bible, in the New Testament church, there is no biblical account of a worship, again, in the New Testament, that has the use of instruments. Instruments in worship are not to be used under the New Testament law. We, as New Testament Christians, choose to neither take from nor add to the Word of God, and we understand that we are to follow the New Testament Christian's example in our establishment of worship. So we choose not to use instruments in worship. Moving on from the singing, we'll move on to what I'm doing now, and that's the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God in the service. So, like I said, I'm preaching to myself as much as I am anyone else, because these are things that I have had a problem with. That's what originally brought me to study this, and I figured that if I could make them into something else, I may be able to help somebody else. So, originally I saw preaching as something that was for older men who can quote the Bible almost cover to cover, because they're the ones that would actually understand it. They'd be the ones that would be able to stand up here and explain it to me, and I'd be able to take from it that way. Someone like Wendell or like Randy that's studied the Bible extensively. But, you know, I understand now that if that was the truth, there'd be no reason for me to be up here. I've been in the church my whole life, and I've been a Christian since I was young, but in no way can I claim to have the same understanding of God's Word as some of these men who have studied it much longer and much more in depth than I have. But that doesn't mean that I can't stand up here having studied something and apply it to a lesson and have other people take from it and apply it to their studies further into their lives. So, if we strive for the goal of coming here each service, listening to the preacher, and taking something from the lesson to apply further to our studies or to apply to our lives or to apply to our worship in this case, we're really following with what we're commanded to do. If you look at the commandment in the Bible, when Jesus sent out the apostles in what's called the Great Commission, He said, go unto all the world and teach. So we come together and we preach the Word of God on the first day of each week, as you may suspect, by the example of the early church. If you look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts 27 says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break the barriers, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. So here we see a few things. They came together on the first day of the week. This is the first day of the week. And as we are today, they were given a lesson from a man standing in front of them preaching, which is what we are doing here and what we do every Sunday. Therefore, we continue to do this to this day. It's not, it's not a very complex thing to look at. The differences come in now that we preach with technology. You know, I'm using an app on my cell phone to pull up Bible verses when I'm studying for this lesson. I'm standing here and I can see what's on that screen on a screen in front of me. We use this projector to put PowerPoints up when Dave and Randy preach. We have the live stream going. We have the video game that's going to put this video on YouTube. And it's amazing that we have all this, but that doesn't change the end goal. The overall goal of a man standing here and preaching to you 
is just what it said there in the Bible. We're here so that we can admonish those who are in earshot with the knowledge that we have gained from study of the Bible, and we can hopefully word that in a way such that people can take from it and, like I said, again, apply to their studies and apply to their lives. Right. So, once again, there are some problems that come in with the preaching. Um, while an overwhelming majority of preachers in the true church have the goal of giving you a lesson about the Bible that can make you a stronger Christian, increase your faith, and maybe point out something that you're doing wrong that you can work on yourself or come to us and work on. There are some who may not be as well versed, and they may misspeak, and that's okay. You come to them after the lesson, talk with them about that, and if you're following along, you'll catch that. But there are also sometimes when people may intentionally try to misrepresent what's in the Bible. Now, these are called false teachers, and the Bible warns against them in many occasions. So we have to be wary of this. You turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And verse 15. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? So it says here that you will know them by their works. Now how are we going to know them by their works if they're standing up here and they're preaching to us? That's where we come to the active listener's part in hearing a sermon. When you're listening to a sermon, you have to be attentive and follow along. And like I said, I'm preaching to myself as much as I am anyone else. This is something I've struggled with. But it may, it may seem daunting, even to younger Christians or older Christians as well, to follow along because you're not sure if it's been presented incorrectly or if it's been present, if, or if it's been mi misrepresented intentionally. You're not sure if it's just a preacher who is wholeheartedly trying to teach the truth, misspeaking, or if it's a preacher who is intentionally saying something that's not in God's Word. But... Regardless, like I said, come to the preacher after the, after the lesson and talk to them about it. Come to the elders if you're, if you're unsure. Be an active listener, though. At, at all points during the lesson, you should be paying attention to what's said, following along in your Bible, so that if something is misspoken, you can go to them after the lesson, as I said, or for, if for no other reason, if nothing they say is incorrect, you're following along, you're understanding more and more and more of the lesson. It just increases your understanding of the Bible. So, moving on from that, we'll go to something else that is uh, a commanded act of worship, the giving. So, as a congregation, we're commanded to give back on the first day of the week, according to how we've been prospered, as, again, we seen in the Word of God. Back to 1 Corinthians, this time in chapter 16, We'll be looking at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So, this command almost seems somewhat vague, but it does give the qualification, as God hath prospered him. Now, as a mathematical mind, you know my dad's a math teacher, and I'm an engineering major, I see, as God hath prospered him, and I'm not so sure as far as a, an actual number figure there. So, if we look at the Old Testament, it was a common practice to give what was called a tithe. A tithe was 10% of everything. So, a common practice today is to give 10% of that week's income as you're giving for that week, as you have been prospering. 10% of what you've prospered for that week. And... While this is common, it's no way bound. It's not bound that we have to give 10%. You can give more or you can give less, but you give as you have been prospered. Now, something else that comes into play here is the way that we're commanded to give. So, we're commanded to give in a certain way according to the Bible in order to be pleasing to the Lord with our giving. We must give with an open heart, and we should want to give back. 
Similar to the singing, we should be happy to be able to do something that is a command of the Lord in the worship service. It's something so small to us just to give up a small portion of what we've been blessed with from God anyway. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, it says here that God loves a cheerful giver. So, we want the love of the Lord, and this is a commandment. God loves a cheerful giver, so like I said, we should be glad to be giving back for the furtherance of the church. So, it's not necessarily us giving money to the congregation to waste on anything, you know? We give the money, and we give it into the collection, and it goes to the needy saints who are proclaiming God's word. It goes to the upkeep of the building so that we can come here and worship in comfort, we can come here to a building that's air conditioned with comfortable seats and things like that. And that's really where it goes. It doesn't go to just whatever. There are outlines in God's Word for where the giving is to go. So, something that's often misconstrued is that the Lord's Supper and the giving are one. I know growing up, this was really common for me, and I know a couple other people around my age growing up because of the way that we used to do things with the Lord's Supper and the collection. We would do it close together, all as, almost all as one. I understand that there was a, a statement given each time, and as I was young, I, and I said I had attention problems, I didn't quite catch that part. But I understand now that the giving and the Lord's Supper are two separate things. So we have to be sure that we keep these separate so as to not allow this confusion to come into play. So, when the Lord brought the apostles together prior to his crucifixion, he gave them a ritual to use to remember his sacrifice at Calvary. The Lord's Supper is a commandment that's explicitly given when the Lord outlines the way that it is to be done. If you look at Matthew chapter 26, we'll look at verses 26 through 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So we follow this outline given from Christ as closely as we possibly can, which is why we take things in the order that we do partake. So if you look back, he says, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it. So we bless the bread before we partake, and then we take the bread before the fruit of the vine. We bless the fruit of the vine before we partake, just as Jesus blessed the, blessed the cup. So, <clears throat> so, we continue on from Jesus' model here, and we understand that there is a certain way, just as there are with other things, just as with the giving and with the singing, there are certain ways that we are supposed to do this. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, I want to come back to this and look at it as, as directly as I can as somber as I can be to look at this, and I want to give special emphasis to something here. Who shall, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, that is to partake of it in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty explicitly stated that if we partake of the Lord's Supper in a manner that is deemed unworthy, that we are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. This is a pretty dire consequence. So we have to be humble in knowing that we can never earn Jesus' sacrifice. That it was something that was given to us. And we have to live our lives as we are told to live our lives in the Bible so that we can protect this emblem or these emblems in a manner that is worthy. So that we can be as close to Jesus' model as possible. So, in the beginning of the lesson, I said 
that I be using the acts of worship to learn about worship in spirit and in truth. And now that I've kind of gone through an outline of the, the acts of worship, I want to kind of make an application. So I want to look back at John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, what I said would be the main text for this lesson. I want to read it again to refresh it in your minds. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, when I think about the worship, wholeheartedness is a term that comes to mind. And I think that's something that should completely define our worship. I think if it's to be done in spirit and in truth, and I believe the Bible backs this, that if we worship wholeheartedly, we set our focus on nothing other than the task at hand, which is worshiping God and protecting these emblems, giving, singing hymns, and praying, and learning from God's Word, I think wholeheartedness is a, is a good term to describe that. So, if we abide by this idea of being completely and totally encompassed in what we're doing, and we keep the things that I've brought forth from God's Word in the forefront of our minds, then the worship will be in spirit. Now, we will both be glorifying God more wholly, and we will gain more for ourselves from each service. This is our worship in spirit, because we are totally enveloped in the worship, and we are truly gained for, from it spiritually. Now, everything that I've outlined has come directly from God's Word. I've given book, chapter, verse for everything that we've outlined here this evening. And we can't add to that. We can't take anything from that. God's Word is its given explicitly what we need to do. So, I want to task you with being attentive to what we add to and take from the worship service. It should be only what's in God's Word. If you look at the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, this is something that the Lord is disallowing in the Old Law. He says, You shall not add to the Word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, to insert a bit of logic here, if God didn't allow the more restrictive old law to add to or to take from it, would He allow us to add to His Word and follow Him how we think we should under the new law? I don't think that I think so. I, mean, I believe that this is written before times for our admonition. I believe this is something that we can look back at and we can understand that God doesn't want us to add to His Word. And everything that I've said here about the worship, I believe if we follow it from God's Word, not adding to or taking from the outline that we've been given, I believe that that is worship in the truth. So, if we're fully attentive, we're worshiping in spirit. And if we're following along with God's outline explicitly, that is in truth. So that is worship in spirit and in truth. So, just to kind of reiterate here, when we come to worship, we are coming to worship the most powerful being that is. I would say that is or was, but there is no was or time to God. God simply is in eternity. He has done the most amazing things that in our human history have ever been done. He spoke everything that exists into existence. He's raised people from the dead. He's caused animals to speak. It's amazing what God's power is. Mm -hmm. If you look at God's power and then you look at the commands that He's given us, to come here and to worship for an hour or two hours at a time is in... The grand scheme of things is a small task. And it's something so minor from our week that we can take out. And we can be completely encompassed in this. And we can strengthen our faith. And we can come here and do that and bring glory to God. We can do something so simple and it brings glory to the Lord. And like I said, this is something that I have struggled with. I come here and I allow the world to creep in. I allow everything to come into me and I'll be, I won't be attentive, I won't be paying attention, I won't be singing along or 
following along with the prayer and I understand now. I've studied more. I understand that this isn't how I should be doing things. This is how it should be. We should be worshiping in spirit and in truth. Everything that we should, everything that we do in our lives should be to the glory of God. But especially when we're here to worship God, everything that we do should be according to His will and to His glory. So I mentioned Jesus' sacrifice, the Lord's sacrifice, and on that topic, I'll come to the end of my lesson this evening. You know, I would really be failing to truly proclaim God's Word if I didn't also offer the Gospel, the good news of Jesus. Jesus Christ, as a man come to earth, was willing to suffer pain greater than what anyone alive that has ever lived or ever will live has ever suffered. It's not something that we can even remotely imagine, and He did it all while carrying the weight of every sin that I have ever committed, every sin that you have ever committed, and every sin that every other human being that has ever existed has ever committed. And it's amazing that He did that for us, and He gave us this small command. He did this all so that we can have salvation through Him, and that is the only way to have salvation. There is no salvation through any other means than to come to Him through Jesus Christ and to be baptized for the remission of your sins. I want to leave you with one verse and then the lesson is yours. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We don't know when Jesus will come. We don't know if He'll come in five minutes, five days, five years, or five minutes. We don't know when He will come. But we have to live our lives with the expectation that we could die at any moment. You don't, you're not promised another breath. You're not promised that when you leave here tonight, you'll be able to come back ever again. You're not promised that you will make it home tonight. So if there is anything wrong in your life, if there is anything that you need to make right, if you're not a child of God, please come. And come as we stand and as we sing. Troublesome times are here for you.